Hi everyone, this video is aimed at our S1, 2 and 3 pupils for the S1s working on a design and make project and for the S2 and 3 pupils who are learning about tools to design and manufacture with but also it's good revision for our national 4 and 5 pupils to design and manufacture. Today I'm going to run through tools, what they are, what they're used for and how to set them up. As you're watching this video, it's a good idea to take some notes on the different tools and equipment that we're going to be looking at. For some of you, you'll have the worksheet that I've provided or you might have a different worksheet from a different class, but it's a good idea to always be taking notes when you're working through classwork. On this sheet here, you'll see there's spaces where I'm going to ask you to name tools. There's some descriptions along the middle of what different tools and equipment's for and there's a word bank to help you out when you're filling the boxes in. So, the first tool we're going to be looking at is what's called a tenon saw, T-E-N-O-N. -E and this saw is designed for working with wood and it's designed to cut straight lines in wood. It's got a handle, it's got a blade, and along the back here, Traditionally, that would be a brass back, it would be to keep the saw blade straight. To use this saw, you would mark onto your wood where you want the waste to be. So we'd measure how far from the end we want this line to be, mark your waste. So we know that we're cutting on the correct side of the line. And the rule is, we always cut waste side of the line. I'm going to put the saw down on the wood. I'm going to cut it by pushing this saw. Using the bench hook on the bench to protect it, I can line up the line near the, the upright at the end of the bench hook, position the piece of wood, hold it like this, not with your thumb out. Position the saw, drag back a couple of times. And then saw through the piece of wood in one neat go. Okay, so you can see there, this piece of wood, there's some splinters on the end here, we'll just sand these off. But at the moment, you can see that my line is still on the piece of wood and I've cut just the side of that piece of wood. That's what we do every single time we cut. Now, the next piece of wood I'm going to cut is this piece of plywood. Plywood is not a natural growing material, it's a man-made material, but it's made from natural wood by layering it up. It is very strong in all directions, that's why we use it. It's also a nice flat sheet material. We can do things like cut a squiggle along it, or a, or a curve, or a wave, or whatever you want to call it. We always mark our waist like I've done here, but the saw that I'm going to use for this job is not the tenon saw, because the tenon saw is not very good at cutting round corners or curves. We'll put that to the side. The saw I'm going to use is going to be the coping saw because it copes with curves or it copes with difficult situations. What I need to do, I need to put my piece of plywood or whatever wood I'm using into my bench vise. Now I'm right handed so I'm going to cut from right to left but before I do that I need to adjust this saw. So if I hold the pin here and the frame of the saw and left the Lucy on the handle. That means that the saw blade can be turned by moving the pin at either end. Now you've got to be careful when you're doing this, don't twist the blade, so you need to move the pins to be exactly the same. To tighten it back up, it's righty tighty, and again you need to stop this pin from moving, so I hold that and the frame, and I'm just turning that to the right hand side. So that's me setting my saw up. And again, I'm cutting waist side of the line along here, to do this, I hold both hands on the, on the handle. I stand with my feet apart about shoulder width, bend my knees so I don't get a sore back. And I'm gonna cut along here waist side. Now this is a pull saw. This cuts by pulling. So I'm gonna drag it to cut, get started. And all the way along, I'm making sure that my blade is parallel with the surface of the bench. And I'm using as much of the length of the blade as possible. It's a skinny blade, you can see that. If it gets hot by using just a little bit like this, you can snap the blade so we don't like that. 
So look at that. I've just cut this nice curve here. You can see that I'm waist side of the line, but I've actually got a bit much here and a little bit much here. So I'll use one of my tools later on to show you how to fix that. That was a coping saw cutting curves. This saw is called a scroll saw. This is a machine saw and it works with the blade moving up and down when this arm moves up and down. The blade is here, it's kind of like a coping saw blade, really quite skinny. We've got to look after these and don't put too much pressure on them, otherwise they'll snap. You can see that there's a lever here to tension the saw blade up to make it tough enough to do the job. We have to push that lever back. There's now tension on the blade. You can see that we've got an emergency stop button here. When we're using this saw, we have to make sure that our workpiece, our piece of material, is always flat on the table. The table is nice and slidey so the wood can move around a lot. And what you're going to do, you're going to see a view like this when you're using this saw, and we have to feed the blade along just to the waist side of the line that we've marked on here. And again, this saw is very good for cutting curved lines or difficult lines. When we're using this saw, we have to make sure that our workpiece, our piece of material, is always flat on the table. The table is nice and slidey so the wood can move around a lot. And what you're going to do, you're going to see a view like this when you're using this saw, and we have to feed the blade along just to the waist side of the line that we've marked on here. And again, this saw is very good for cutting curved lines or difficult lines. Now, this is a machine, so I must wear my safety goggles. They're very fetching and they do their job very well. And I'm going to start the machine using the green button which is underneath where the mouse stop was and you'll see me feed the saw blade here along the line, just waist side of it, as I said before. coming along here, in fact it's really nice and smooth, that blade must be perfect for cutting this plywood. However, I have gone over the line a little bit here because it's actually sometimes a little bit tricky to follow the curve so you've got to be careful about that. Later on I might need to do a little more bit finishing here or I could just sand the line off if I'm happy enough with that. Now we're going to have a look at the tools we can use to cut metal. This is a piece of metal sheet. This is steel. You can see that there's some rust on the surface because it's been you know, lying around for quite a long time. And then this here, this is also a metal. It comes in different shapes. You can buy it in, in different sections. This is a piece of brass here. Here's another piece of steel that's been cut from a longer piece. So you can see it comes in different shapes and sizes like this, and like this, and anything in between. Now on this piece of material, this is that sheet steel, what I've done is I've marked out the line that I want to cut. I'm going to take this little square out of the corner. Now we've got two tools we can do that. No matter which tool we're using though, we have to use metal tools to support your, your material. We can't use the bench vise because that would ruin the bench vise, because it's metal we're working with, it's much harder. So we have to use an engineer's vise. The engineer's vise works in the same way as a bench vise. It's made of metal and it's got metal jaws to hold a piece of metal securely when we're working on it. So all I have to do is I place my, my metal into the engineer's vise. And again, the, the number one rule that I'm going to use for accuracy is I'm going to cut the side of the line, this time using a hacksaw. Now the hacksaw, is kind of like the tenon saw, but for metal, it's got a long straight blade here. The frame is nice and tough and it's straight. It's got a sizable handle on it so you get a good grip on the saw. Got my trigger finger here to make sure that it stabilizes the saw, it can't be pushed that way. Line the saw up, waist side off the mark, drag it back. Uh, 
two colour is, is coming off because it got stuck in the, the cut that I'm doing. I've done one already, I'm going to rotate that in the vise and do the other one. Now on the second cut, I'm going to use this saw. This is what we call a junior hacksaw. The junior hacksaw does the same job as a hacksaw, except it's much smaller. The blade is much thinner and it's very good for intricate jobs or little tricky jobs. I'm having to hold the workpiece so it doesn't vibrate too much and the junior hacksaw I just use one hand on here and I've just got to be a bit more careful with it. Junior hacksaw has done its job so now the piece of material that I wanted is here on the edge of the metal there might be some little metal splinters called burr we don't want to cut our finger on that, so what I would do now is I'd go away and I would file that to make sure that the edge is safe. Now we're going to talk about the power drill. Now the power drill is a machine which is handheld. It's got a battery and the battery powers the drill, so it's called a power drill. The drill holds the drill bit. The drill bit drills holes in different types of material. This drill bit is called a lip and spur drill and to explain that I've got a bigger version for you just here. The lip and spur drill has a pointy spur on the end and a lip at either side of it. You can see here and here is the lip and the spur is right in the middle. That means that you can be very accurate with the placement when you start your job because of the spur in the middle. Compare that to this, which is just what we call a twist drill or a jobber bit, and it's got a much broader point on the end of it and it's harder to place accurately. I've marked out the position for my hole to be drilled at on a piece of material. You might have several of these, depends what you're doing with them. You might want to hold pencils in the holes, or you might want to use a dowel to join two pieces of material together. Where the cross is, I'm going to use a bradle. Here is a very sharp point. And what's going to happen is I'm going to put that on the cross where I've marked out the position of my hole, hold it vertically and press in the way. That's left a little indent there. And that means that when you're drilling, you can drill a hole to very high accuracy because the drill bit, the pointed bit on the end here, will follow the little mark you've left. Here's a handy tip for you. If you know that you want to drill a hole, say which is 20 millimetres deep, what you can do is you can measure with a rule, you can measure 20 millimetres from the end. Notice where zero was, so you go to 20 at that point. Get a little bit of masking tape and put that piece of masking tape around the drill bit. That means that when I'm drilling, which I'm about to do now, I will stop when I reach the masking tape. To use the drill, put the spur into the little hole that the bridle left. That means that's accurate, even if I want to move it sideways, I can't. Make sure your drill bit is straight up and down the way, vertical, pull the trigger, push down the way, and when you get to the masking tape, stop. That hole in here is now exactly 20 millimetres deep. This is a pillar drill. It's a drill on a pillar, hence pillar drill. Here, you can see that the drill bit is held perfectly vertical by the chuck and when I pull the lever down, it can only move up and down in a vertical manner. That means that it's very good at drilling your holes nice and straight into your wood. 
With the power drill, you're relying on your hand to control how vertical it was. With this, you're guaranteed to get a good result. To use it, I've got my wood in a machine vise. It's a vise that goes with a machine, so it's called a machine vise. I position it, I've got my bradle mark already in here. I put the guard over. This means little bits of wood can't come flying out and hurt me, or if it's metal that I'm drilling, it would be the same reason. I need to make sure the power is on. I have positioned my piece of wood. I'm going to hold the vise on the left-hand side. Press go with the green button. Pull the lever. And it will stop at the same place each time I use it and the reason is there's a mechanical stop that I've set my depth to 20 millimeters this time. With the power drill I have to use the masking tape, with the pillar drill I can set the stop on the machine itself. This is the pillar drill from the view that you would have when you were using it. You can see here we have the start button and the stop button. On this machine, this is the emergency stop. The stop button is actually on the ground there. Also on this machine, we have the levers here to set the height of the table because we can move this table up and down. And we have the depth stop that I talked about here. that has got a gauge on it so you can see exactly how far you're going to drill. It will stop when I set it before. At zero to 30 in this case. Now we're going to look at how to make a curve on a piece of wooden material, for example. Same applies for metal, you use the same tool. Well, the second tool you use is the same, the first one's different. Now, on here, I've already done a cut here with a tenon saw to make that flat here, it means I'm removing much less material with this next tool. I'm going to put my piece of wood into the vise, then I'm going to take a rasp. Now a rasp is essentially the same as a file, except the file is smoother and the rasp has these really, really jaggy teeth that wear away whatever you rub against it. There's the file has got a rough pattern on it. And again, its job is to wear away things you rub against it, but it will take much less material off. I'm going to use a rasp first because I've got more shaping to do. I'm going to place this across my piece of wood. Finger and thumb here. You never ever do this because you can cut your hand going over your material. Finger and thumb only. As you push across, just rotate. What I did was I put a little angle on it so I don't destroy the back edge of this piece of material. What I can do now is spin it round and finish off the other side using the same technique. The rasp is very rough, it does a rough cut. The file comes in a variety of roughness. From a rough cut file to a fine cut file, this is a rough cut file, quite dirty and it's cleaned. This is a half round file because half of it is round, the other side is flat. Here we have a square file, it's still a file, it's just the section of it is square. So I'm going to finish this off using the file. And hey presto! We have a nice rounded corner, just like so. You can see here that I've got what we call a flat file, and the reason is this is flat on each side. You'll see on here there's no grooves because this is your safe edge, so you can't wear away into a corner if you're filing down into a corner.
This is a plane. The plane is used to scrape away thin pieces of wood like this from the surface of your material. It has a handle at the front, handle at the back. In here, it's got a wheel that you can turn to adjust the depth that the blade will stick out the bottom to. Now the blade along here is super sharp. Never check how sharp it is with your finger, please. This lever here, left and right, that adjusts the angle at which the blade sticks out the bottom of the plane. Generally, we want that to be flat across at right angles to the edge. You can see on this piece of wood that I've got a line going along here and on the other edge I have a line going along here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to use a plane to cut what we call a chamfer. I'm going to make a 45 degree angle slope along the edge of the piece of wood. So I've set my wood parallel with the French vise, take my plane, instead of running it smoothly or flat across the surface like this, what I'm going to do is I'm going to rotate my right wrist at 45 degrees and push along and just repeat that several times until you touch the line. When you touch the line, that's you cut way side of the line, don't want to take the line off. And hey presto, we have a chamfer. You see that along there? Nice, neat, tidy chamfer. This piece of equipment is called the belt sander or the band facer. It's used to remove end grain from pieces of wood to go down to the line we have marked previously. This is really good, especially if you've cut a little bit of squint and you need to make it at right angles. You can do this really accurately with, the, with this machine. We have a start button and a stop button. On the floor on this machine, we have a kick button for the emergency stop. We have to wear goggles and we never ever wear gloves. The table supports your piece of wood. The belt will move down the way and take off the end of the piece of wood. As the belt is moving down the way, you have to push your wood into the face, but you also move your wood sideways because if you just hold it in one spot, you're gonna rip a hole into the belt. And one other thing, you have to make sure that the extraction system is on over here at the background, because this will take all the dust away. I'm going to do that now. The extraction unit is on, you can hear the noise in the background. Go! So you can see here now that my line is still on my piece of wood but I've sanded right down to it now so that's super neat, that's really really nice. Thanks to everyone for taking the time to watch this video. If you have any more questions about the tools or equipment that we're going to be using, ask your teacher, ask one of your classmates. Don't be shy, get in touch if you're stuck. Take care everybody, bye.